Welcome to the Everyday Ministry Podcast, where ministers get together to discuss everyday ministry. Welcome to the Everyday Ministry Podcast, where a podcast where everyday ministers get together to discuss ministry. This is James White, the pastor at Lighthouse Community Church, and I'm sitting here with Chris and Daniel. I uh, hope everything's been going well with y'all this past few weeks since we recorded last. On my end, nothing's any different, just normal life things, work, school, church, things of such. But Chris, how is everything going in the great state of Louisiana? Oh, everything's going well, um, mostly for me because I'm not an LSU fan. But yeah, everything's pretty normal over here. Just church and work and family and all that good stuff. Well, to be fair, you're no no kind of fan. So <laughs> I'm a fan. To be fair, just in case there's any LSU people out there. <laughs> yes, I do have to clarify that I'm not I'm not a sports fan. I'm not anti LSU. I'm just not a sports fan. Well, how do you feel about the news of Stan Lee passing away? Oh yes, I was a Stan Lee fan. Um, you know, it he dude was 95 years old, so it, while it's sad, I also kind of expected it and I did actually get my picture taken with him la- uh, earlier this year, kind of with the thought of I don't know whenever I'm going to have another chance to do this again. I may never have another chance to do this again. Um, and his wife had passed away relatively recently as well. And I think that affected him. But yeah, I mean, he had a long life. He had a huge career you know and has impacted a lot of things so i don't know the state of his spiritual beliefs or anything like that but hopefully he was a believer so yeah uh, you know obviously that as a christian that's always something that's going to cross through your mind but long successful life you know by all uh, worldly accounts no doubt pretty sure just about anybody in america's watched or read something that he's been a part of producing but anyway daniel you haven't been on in about a month or two. How's everything been going, man? Uh, man, things have been good for me. I was driving a dump truck for a company out here where I'm living, and that job ended. And so my my time has opened up a little bit more, thank goodness. I'm currently the fill-in worship leader at our at my church, and, and that's going really well. I've been doing that for about eight weeks now, so it's been at least that long since I've been on. Uh, the podcast. And so, cause I haven't shared that with you guys, at least not on air. <laughs> and then uh, we are preparing for our second child to arrive. Is, and we found out that it's going to be a boy and we're going to name him Jack Walker Brown. Sounds like a strong country singer. <laughs> so it's going to be good. He's going to make us millions. Either that or a bad guy in a John Wayne flick. Either way, millions. Cause he's going to be either, right. either or a Hollywood star. So I'm good with that. Well, man, that's exciting. Y'all's little boy will be there uh, probably just a few weeks after me and Sarah introduced Lottie to the world. So uh, exciting times. Chris, are y'all going to have a, a little one anytime soon? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, to be fair to you, you have older kids. So Yeah, I've got an eight-year-old. Well, my daughter just turned eight uh, a few days ago, and then we have a five-year-old as well. So. And if the Lord blesses us with more, uh, we'll take them. But as of as of right now, we're not aware of any. Well, guys, I'm glad everything's been going well for both of you and myself. And unfortunately, uh, as the listeners probably could already tell, Jamie's not on here. He's uh, got a sick daughter at home, so he's having to help his wife take care of her. And so, but as we get into the conversation tonight, as we're working through the Baptist Faith and Message on our third Monday's episode, we got to the point last month we covered the first part of the second article, which is God. And really in that uh, recording, uh, you can go back and listen to it, but we addressed just the Trinity as a whole. And then tonight we're going to briefly walk through parts A, B, and C of the same article. 
And so we're not going to cover this one line by line like we did the previous one, just because we're covering a lot of information there. But we do want to jump into this conversation tonight so that we can take most advantage of our time as possible. And so first, I want to begin by reading the first article, which is God the Father. And this is what it says. It says, God as Father reigns with providential care over his universe, his creatures, and the flow of the stream of human history according to the purpose of his grace. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and all-wise. God is Father in his truth to those whom become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the fatherly in his attitude towards all men. Now, this is just a very brief explanation of God the Father, but I actually really enjoyed this article, and that's why I took advantage of reading this one instead of the other two, um, <laughs> just because it just introduced this huge attribute of God the Father. As we walk through it, initially, is there any part of this statement that just jumps off the pages to you two guys? Yeah, I, I think that sometimes I struggle with this. It says that he is fatherly in his attitude towards men. Um, and I think that it's something that needs to be clarified uh, often where it, people would say, um, you know, as what's the Christmas song that says Santa Claus knows we're all God's children and that makes everything right. Um, Santa Claus is coming to town. I don't know. That, that lyric always stands out to me because <laughs> in, <the middle laughs> in the middle of a Christmas song about Santa Claus, Elvis is singing. And, uh, he says Santa Claus knows we're all God's children. Well, God is all humanity's uh, creator yeah. um, and he is fatherly in certain ways as we could discuss but in the most important way in some sense he's not all of our father right we're not all god's children yeah i mean i definitely get what you're saying i think that's why in the baptist faith and message it has um the two different sentences and briefly introduces kind of what you're getting in at there because the second sentence of this part of the article says, he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and all-wise. And then the uh -huh. next sentence says, God is Father in truth to those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. That the true children of God are those that have faith in Christ, that have repented of their sins, trust in Jesus uh, for forgiveness of that, that sin. But he does have this attribute about him and this general care for all creatures mm -hmm. that he is fatherly towards them. We definitely see this in the fact that everyone on this earth has good things that happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, just because they're not children of God doesn't mean that it's literally hell on earth for every individual all day, every day. That I think it's, we edited this part out because I messed up. But Daniel just kind of said it that, you know, the, the good falls on the righteous and unrighteous, that that the good things happen to those on this earth that don't know Jesus, just as it does to those that do know Christ and salvation. And so God provides for all people, you know, that we are all able to breathe and to live and to have commonly good things in this world. And we actually we see this fatherly love that God has for us in several different ways and a bunch of different scriptures, but talking about and just referencing to those that trust in Christ for salvation, that we are the children of God. We see this throughout all of scripture, but we really see some ways that he provides for us is that he, he protects us. He gives, he encourages his children. He comforts his children, that he, he does these things for those that are his. And I, I think that's an amazing picture of who God is because I think so often, rightfully we think of god as the one on the throne that we can't approach right that he is so holy so perfect that we have to be careful in the way that we approach him and by all means we should but he's also the heavenly father and he wants us to approach him like a father one thing i do appreciate about the article as well though is just the small introduction of these attributes of god the father that is all powerful, all knowing, all loving, and all wise. This is just a very brief part of this statement here, but it's so important that we understand these things that this is who God is. And it's because of the first statement, which is that He is the creator of all, that this is His universe, these are all His creatures, and we all or, or exist and live because God has willed it to be so. And we see this true in the fact that he is working at all things because he is all powerful, all knowing, all loving, and all wise. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about just how it talks about 
which you just mentioned it, talking about the universe and how he's all powerful, knowing, loving, and wise. But something that really stands out to me is how it talks about this providential care mm. over the universe, the creatures, and on top of that, the flow as the wording here is the flow of the stream of human history. But the way that I kind of think about it is just the timeline of, of our world. Um, even, even beyond what our history books might say in, in, in specific areas and places that we don't necessarily have knowledge of the history of man. God has all that knowledge. It's all there uh, right at the forefront of his mind. And so, you know, for me, when I think about that, I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around that from a perspective of everyday ministry. And so when I kind of look at that from a big, you know, 30,000 foot range, you're thinking about the entire history of the universe. God is the one who's orchestrated that. And then you bring it down to, you know, down to the ground and ground zero, so to speak. And you see that God not only orchestrated the entire universe, but he orchestrates every single moment of every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's what the father does for us. You know, we're looking at it in here in the Baptist faith and message from a really broad spectrum. But if you bring it down to the personal um, mindset, you realize that that is helping us to see that he is intimately involved in everything that's going on in our everyday life. Yeah, I agree completely. And really when you, like you're saying there, but when you think about it, and it's hard for us to keep this at the forefront of our minds, but even in the difficult moments that happen in ministry, even when it seems like nothing you do is right, or you don't have the right amount of time to do what you need to do in preparation or whatever the case may be, that God has orchestrated this out for his will and to accomplish his will and for his glory so that he would be the one that is honored in our lives. And uh, I appreciate you pointing that out, Daniel. I think that was a, a good point of just connecting it to everyday ministry. As we move forward and we look at God the Son, Chris, do you mind reading that statement as a whole? I do not mind. Christ is the eternal Son of God. In his incarnation as Jesus Christ, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature with its demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind, yet without sin. He honored the divine law by his personal obedience and in his, and in his substitutionary death on the cross, he made provision for the redemption of men from sin. He was raised from the dead with a glorified body and appeared to his disciples as the person who was with them before his crucifixion. He ascended into heaven and is now exalted at the right hand of God, where he is the one mediator, fully God, fully man, and whose person is affected the reconciliation between God and man. He will return in power and glory to judge the world and to consummate his redemptive mission. He now dwells in all believers as the living and ever-present Lord. I just, I just want to point out first, before we get into any of the depth of this statement, um, this first little bitty sentence is that Christ is the eternal son of God. Now it may seem odd that we point that out because, you know, we're listening to a ministry podcast and looking at your Baptist faith message. But the reason I want to point that out is because if you haven't read this, I would encourage you to is, um, life free research partnered with uh league of New ministry. Look at, look at, I've got that pulled up right now, man. You can't see it too. on my phone. I 70, do too. 78%. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was Lifeway and League of New Ministry partnering together to do this research called the State of Theology in America. And that may not be the technical term for what it is, but you, you'll you figure it out. I'll put it in the show notes. And there's this question that was asked is that is Jesus the first and greatest being created by God? And 78% agreed to some extent that it is true that Christ is the first and greatest being created by God. But what we know about Christ and what I, I pray and hope that we're being and presenting clearly to our church is that Christ is the eternal son of God, that uh -huh. he was not created by God That's at right. the time of all creation or at all. And I think that it, we have to start there and that those six little words, I think it's what that is because everything else falls apart if we don't start there. And that's what I, um, especially I think that sometimes that, 
as we just talked about, God pro- providentially works through history that in the the hearts and the men that wrote out this article of faith that we as Southern Baptists believe, they began here because as I look at our society, that 78% disagree with this 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 idea at some level, yeah. and it's horrible. Uh, yeah, and it says 78% of United States evangelicals. Yeah, mm-hmm. sorry. Right, well, and it maybe, probably has mostly most to do with the fact that it's just simple ignorance yeah. and not realizing the way that the question was worded. But in reality, also not having the presence of mind and the clarity of mind enough to recognize that that was – a tricky question and it was intended to throw them off which just goes to show that 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 truth is not buried deep down in their heart well the issue though is that 50 percent who agree is higher it's it's 52 percent higher than it was in 2016 wow and so it kind of shows you even where it's at in the last was that two years yeah and I, i'd like to throw just a quick sidebar in there too for for one of the other I would call it a cult religion within our society, Jehovah's Witness. Um, Jehovah's Witness would will, if they ever are to approach you and, and come to your home or something of that nature and want to talk to you, they are very good at making their belief system sound almost identical to ours until you get to certain points of, of conversation. And one of those points being Christ. Um, they believe that Christ was created by God. Um, and and so if you ever are unsure <laughs> as to who's talking to you about what, uh, you can you can nail that down real quick uh, by just asking them what they believe about Jesus uh, and see where they go with that because that is a very hot topic for them is that they are adamant that Jesus is not, they will call him the son of God, but they believe that he is the created son of God and not the eternal son of God, just like James was clarifying there. So, just to add a sidebar in there, that's that's a good way, a good thing to note um, if you're talking to them and you're unsure what they really claim to believe. You can ask them about that, and they'll they'll let you know quick. Yeah, as well as uh, the Mormons, as you know, who believe yeah. they're well, they're well, they're not. We're not allowed to call them Mormons anymore. They're no. <laughs> I'll still call Church them Latter Day Saints. Right. Um. You know, they believe that Jesus is a created being that him and the devil or or him and lucifer were brothers and all all that kind of stuff and yeah. down a different stream of logic but you could see why the typical it the typical christian in the united states would hear of a jehovah's witness or a mormon and what they believe and not realize that there's such a huge distinction just at the very foundation of who god is sure. um, if they're if they are being tr- if you know if this was asked in a tricky way uh, you know understandable it does kind of sound like uh you know the firstborn of all creation paul said that um you know the image of the invisible god firstborn of all creation so that you know kind of a tricky question possibly but it's it's important to have that nailed down mm-hmm. um to know who god is and yeah, that we're not we can, theist. yeah we could be gracious like when you look at the breakdown of the ones that responded to the question, um, you had, you know, 42% that uh, responded strongly agree. And then uh, some that somewhat agreed and some that somewhat disagreed and then some that strongly disagreed. And then you had the 15% that uh, said not sure. And I think that would go into the category of the 74% if I'm not mistaken. And so we can be gracious towards them and say that maybe, they were, they didn't understand the way the word, the question was worded or something of the nature. But I think that as we read through the article itself, you know, we started there because it's so important that we understand that God is the eternal son of God, that, that Christ is the eternal son of God. So that Christ is completely God, God. But we also see is that in the third sentence, it says Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature with its demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind yet without sin is that Christ, even though he is the eternal son of God, that he himself, I I love the way it's kind of worded it here is identifying himself. He took on the form of man and became completely man. 
And it's necessary that we believe these two things about Christ is because if we separate that Christ was completely God and completely man, that then the redemption that we find in Christ was not possible. And so uh, I think that this statement here is another thing that just goes hand in hand with its first statement. Which, by the way, Chris, I would say is one of the reasons that this is the longest description of the three persons of God, because definitely God, the son, Jesus Christ is his role, I guess, for lack of a better term, in the Trinity and in the redemptive process in history is absolutely the most controversial in who claims to believe what about him. And so it had to be as specific as possible to clarify all the different ways that Jesus worked in redemptive history. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, I mean, it's so specific. And at the same time, sometimes we have a tendency to to get too bogged down in the specifics. But in this case, you have to be as clear as you possibly can in the specifics of Christ, because any of these things, if they're taken out of context or if they are misunderstood in some way, can absolutely have a detrimental effect on our system of belief as we move forward in our faith. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and and I think that it's possible that, for lack of a better way of describing it, it seems that a lot of description about God and possibly even, you know, in the, the first part of this article or the intro introduction to this article uh, that we covered last time, it, it describes in a lot of when we think of the Old Testament, often people are thinking of, well, that was God, that God that we thought of then that was God the Father. So like all of those descriptions, everything we learned about God in the Old Testament, that's all God the Father. And then we have the New Testament, and that's mostly Jesus. And then we just tack on the Holy Spirit <laughs> at the end of it for good measure, just because, you know, for some reason, most people don't even know. Uh, Got to get him in there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I do think that, but in in truth, there are plenty of religions um who look at the God of the Old Testament or, you know, God in the Old Testament and they're okay with that. Um, and, but Jesus and God's work as Christ, that is the, the def- one, uh, I mean, I hate to say, well, we call ourselves Christians, right? So, I mean, it kind of is the defining matter. It is the defining difference in between us and, you know, Jews between us and people who just say, well, uh, you know, God is love and there's many ways to God, you know, like all those kind of different things. Um, Jesus is in many ways the, I mean, he's the chief cornerstone. He is, he is what people find to be ridiculous or. He is the line in the sand. Right. Yes. Yeah. The difference maker. I mean, above, above all of it, he is it. I, I agree completely. I think there's just so much here. It's hard for us to address all of it. Oh, man. Um, you need, you need uh, two hours at least on this well, one. <laughs> or at least one hour, or at least one recording for each of the portions of God, the, each of the portions of the Trinity. But we don't want to talk about this for, you know, six months. So we want to walk our way through the rest of it. But I really... Um, I think that there's so many good things here. I, I hate to jump over all of it, but I, you know, as we were, we we're talking about God the Father, when we we're finding joy in the fact that God is providentially working through the corridors of time, or however you want to think of that, He is working out His will through all of that, and there's joy in that. I wanted to point out one thing that we see in here that we could find so much joy in, and it's that it's one of the last sentences. It says, "He ascended into heaven." and is now exalted at the right hand of God, where he is the one mediator, fully God, fully man, and whose person is affected the reconciliation between God and man. And this is kind of what Chris and Daniel was getting at, is that Christ is that line in the sand, that Christ is that that hinge that, that our door holds onto in this life, is that Christ is our hope. And because Christ is our hope, we see that in the next sentence, he will return in power and in glory to judge the world and to consummate his redemptive mission is that not only was he the redemption that we have found salvation in and that we hold on to now, but he will one day return for those that have come to him in salvation. And when he does, the, the he will consummate this redemptive mission in history. 
and we will be with God forever. And we find great joy in that. That's good. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to the third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit. And I will read this portion of the Baptist faith message. Now it says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God, fully divine. He inspired holy men of old to write the scriptures through illumination. He enables men to understand truth. He exalts, exalts Christ. He convicts men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He calls men to the Savior and effects regeneration. At the moment of regeneration, he baptizes every believer into the body of Christ. He cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, and bestows the spiritual gifts by which they serve God through his church. He seals the believer unto the day of final redemption. His presence in the Christian is the guarantee that God will bring the believer into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He enlightens and empowers the believer and the church in worship, evangelism, and service. Good grief, where do you start? <laughs> well, what I'll say is I, I like that the first line of this, again, it, it um, speaks of him, the Holy Spirit, as being fully divine. And I think, again, that's another you have to start with that. You have to start with the fact that God, the Holy Spirit, is not a lesser demigod or anything like that. Right. He is fully God, um, and that is an important fact. Yeah. Um, and then it goes on to describe, and I don't think we've really talked about this, but as the Trinity, how the Trinity, you know, just the aspect that the Holy Spirit works within the trinity and works you know towards humanity it, it's interesting just the different ways the different persons of the trinity although they are all one work in conjunction with them with himself <laughs> i don't even know how to use the right words um they they work together as one because yeah. they are one but separate yeah. And they work in different ways in the world. Yeah. Well, and I was about to completely say what you were just saying there, Chris. And just So just to echo that, I, I'm hoping that our listeners are seeing, you know, what I'm seeing right now, just as you read, as you know, now we're on the Holy Spirit. We're on the third person of the Trinity. And hopefully what we're seeing in this is that, wow, okay, he's the one who inspired the scriptures. He's the one who gives us the ability to understand the scriptures. He's the one who calls out our sin. He's the one who reveals our need for righteousness. He's the one who helps us to understand the judgment of God. He's the one who regenerates our hearts. He's the one who ties us to the body. So all of these things that we see in scripture happening through God the Father and through God the Son are just as much at the exact same time happening through God the Holy Spirit. And so hopefully what we're seeing is that you can't possibly have one without the other two. Mm -hmm. and you can't possibly take one of the three away just because that one might make you more uncomfortable than the others. You have to have all three. They are inseparable from the beginning of time. Well, I'm going to say something about the statement just for Jamie, since he's not here and me and him, we, I just preached through, um, I'm preaching through John and got to John chapter seven, verse 39 and preached 39 through 52 and 39. It talks about the Holy spirit. So I talked, took the opportunity and just preached on the Holy Spirit and talked about that for a sermon. And as me and him was kind of discussing it before and after I preached it, he made this statement, and I know he would make it here tonight if he was here. It's the second sentence is that he inspired holy men of the old to write scripture through illumination. He enables men to understand truth. And he would say it like this is that, and I agree with him, <clears throat> is that it's important that we also start here too when we, think about scripture itself is that the spirit is the one that has inspired men to write it and then gives us the understanding of scripture. And we have to fall back on this because scripture is completely inherent because it is from God that it was written through men and it all hinges on this. And this is why when we, um, when we looked and started the Baptist faith, the message, we skipped the, the scripture portion because we had already talked about it. But it all has to start there. That's why we've said time and time again that when you read this, when you read a systematic or historical or a biblical theology, they always start with explaining the scripture itself. And this is 
the work of the Holy Spirit begins by how he has inspired men to write the words of God and also how he illuminates it to us. So, you know, I, th- I think it's important that we understand that aspect of it. And that another portion that we need to focus on, and it's kind of going, it kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, episodes we put out every first Monday. And it's as we're walking through uh, Donald Whitney's book, Spiritual Disciplines, I think so often we are, when we approach spiritual disciplines, we as individuals can fall onto one side of the fence or the other, meaning that sometimes some people put all of the work of one being sanctified and growing in their disciplines of the faith on themselves, trusting in themselves to enable them to be more like Christ. And then some people uh, fall into the category of where they may not uh, exercise these disciplines in hopes that the spirit is going to do it completely for them. Um, But I think the, I think it puts it well and says that he cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, and bestows the spiritual gifts by which they will serve God through his churches. That not only does the Spirit do everything that Daniel just summed up for us, but he also is the one that is sanctifying us to be more like Christ. Now, I do think that different from salvation, I do think we play we are a part of this process, right? We, we, we open up scripture, we read scripture, we pray, we seek God. I uh, think that we have to play a portion of this, but ultimately the spirit is the one that's doing the work in us so that we can uh, apply these to our life. Yeah. Amen. Good. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and I'll just say once again, you know, that really, and, and readers, uh, excuse me, you're not reading listeners. Uh, <laughs> If you have the opportunity, or, or I would certainly recommend you go and take a look at the uh, the Baptist Faith and Message for yourself, um, because you'll see that under each section of this article are boatloads of scripture references for each of these different points of what we claim to believe. Uh, and God the Holy Spirit is just the same as the rest. So, because that's going to help you to understand where this is coming from, it's not just what we gather because it sounds good. It's, it's gathered off of scriptural truth. And so, you know, that's just going to help to reiterate what, what we're explaining here. And it's going to help to drive home even deeper. The fact that, you know, okay, not only can I say, I believe this, but I can also go back here and look at where this truth comes from in God's Holy word. And I, I can, and I can specifically point back to, what I believe and why I believe it. And so that's just my encouragement uh, because we are totally not doing this good full justice by, by having such a brief overview of this topic, topic of God and trying to cover the Trinity in, <laughs> in an hour. Uh, and so that, that would be my encouragement. Let this just kind of be a spark, I guess, for you to go deeper in your understanding of, uh, uh, of the persons of God and, and let this kind of be, be a, a springboard, I guess, to give you a desire, hopefully, to learn more, to, to develop a greater understanding of the three persons of God. Because I can confidently tell you that as I have developed and grown in my understanding of the Holy Spirit, it's kind of cool, it's very cool, how it has helped to develop my understanding of Christ and God the Father, as I have grown in my understanding of the Holy Spirit, too. As I ended the last one with by just pointing out something that's very encouraging about the work of Christ, I want to point out one here in the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's the next to last sentence, and it says this. It says, He seals the believer until the day of final redemption. His presence in the Christian is the guarantee that God will bring the believer into the fullness of the statue of Christ. Now, I know we may have other listeners that are not a part of the Southern Baptist denomination and may not completely appear to the Southern Baptist faith and message. And this would be a part that some may disagree on. But we as Southern Baptists and myself find great joy in this sense because of the work of the Holy Spirit on the individual's life. We don't have to worry about losing our salvation, that he is he is sustaining and obtaining our salvation until the day of judgment. Now, obviously, this does not give us an excuse to go and live however we want, right? If we are a new believer in Christ, we will be exactly that. We will live like a new person in Christ Jesus. 
Uh But because of this, when we sin, when we make mistakes, when we fall into temptation, that we still have forgiveness of our future sins in Christ through the work of the Spirit. So therefore, we do not have to worry about every waking moment of our life if we're going to lose our salvation. And this idea brings great fear in so many people's life and yeah and i think part of my hesitancy earlier to even say anything because i was trying not to go full-blown calvinist here but (laughs) just just to recap kind of the process that i think that this and this isn't written just by calvinists so largely not calvinists but it, it kind of walks through this through illumination he enables men to understand he calls men to the savior he also affects regeneration he cultivates christian character and i think that that is important as you were saying that um if the first part has happened where you've been regenerated and you have the spirit you will have christian character you will have the fruits of the spirit you won't live on 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 godly life Uh, and that is all part of the process that's all part of it when he is sealing the believer until the day of the redemption and that it is a guarantee that his presence is a guarantee uh that we will make that we will last that we will persevere that we are preserved and and i'll say that this is something that i found through scripture long before i realized that i was a baptist (laughs) or maybe before i became a baptist um was this idea of you know perseverance of the saints or preservation of the saints or assurance of salvation once saved always saved however you want to say that um and I wasn't raised to believe that at all. Um, and just kind of as a side note, uh, or you know, maybe part of this, that uh, I had a conversation with my parents like two weeks ago, and my parents who were they're charismatic, full blown Pentecostal charismatic uh, believers, they were talking to. They started talking to me about about this about. Um, Basically, you know, for lack of a better word or phrasing, once saved, always saved. <laughs> um, they believe in perseverance of the saints now. And um, it was just kind of like a great conversation to have. And we were able to speak about how freeing it was to have come to this realization that it is uh, God who saves you and he saves you. Uh, I think it was... Um, john 10 28 where he says i give them eternal life and they will never perish no one can snatch them out of my hand i think that was one of the big things that kind of hit my dad when he was realized that but if no one can snatch them out of my hand and i'm a someone then i can't take myself out of his hands right that's good and we were talking about how it doesn't for true believers for true regenerate people um it doesn't free us to want to sin. It frees us to actually to not be in fear and actually to live unto good works because we know that he is, he did the saving work and he's also working in us to do those good works through the spirit. So it's actually more freeing in a good way and not in a bad way that a lot of people kind of preach against whenever they talk about this doctrine. Well, I want to, I want to say this one last thing, and then we'll move to the plugs of the week. Is um, Daniel earlier? He pointed out some ways that this is applying to the everyday minister, which, as we've discussed on here, it's everyone. We all, uh, everyone that has come to Christ's salvation is a minister. So, however you are serving God, if it be uh, in your vocation, if it be in um, in, a, in a vocation in the church or in the secular world, whatever it may be, uh, what we do see is that as Chris just alluded to, is that God empowers us to do the work of God through the work of the Spirit, right? So God is giving us the strength, giving us the ability to go out and to make disciples of all nations. And not only that, but as we see in this, is that the Holy Spirit is the one that illuminates the heart, that opens up the heart, that softens the heart so that they can believe upon Christ. And so as we go out and we share the gospel with people and we seek to make disciples, Let's remember that we don't do anything. We're just a mouthpiece for God. All we are doing is taking his word to people so that they, the work of God can happen in their life. And it's an honor that God would call us to participate with him in this ministry. And I find great joy in that as a minister of the gospel. And so, guys, as we 
to kind of wrap up this episode on the Baptist faith and message, Daniel said it beautifully earlier, and I just want to reiterate it, is that obviously in an hour podcast, we are not going to cover this entire statement in detail like we should. And we are definitely, definitely not going to address every aspect of who God is within an hour. <laughs> and I've told my congregation this, and I'll say it uh, the rest of my life most likely, is that we're going to spend an eternity long getting to know who God is and understanding him better. And so we're definitely not going to do it on an hour podcast, but so go and find the Baptist faith, the message, read through it. Maybe you're like Chris. Uh, maybe you're at one, not, not like Chris now, but like he once was uh, not a Southern Baptist, not, not one that would agree with everything in this. Uh, maybe you question some of our beliefs as Southern Baptist, pick it up and read through it for yourself. See what the Southern Baptists believe. And, uh, and then, as Daniel pointed out, there's so much scripture in this. Read the scripture that goes along with it. Put it to put it to God's word, and let that be the deciding factor for you, not the not the what men has written down. But guys, as we move into the plugs of the week, do you have anything for us? Yeah, I was just going to mention this is an older book, but it's one that that just did wonders for me. Y'all probably already know what I'm about to say, but Forgotten God by Francis Chan was an awesome book that that I read years back. I read it in about three days um, and was so encouraged by by just under, having such such a deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit through a very simple book. So if 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 you know much about Francis Chan, you know that he he's a great writer. He writes on a very simple level. His his books are an easy read. And man, that one just did wonders for me. So I would encourage you uh Go grab that one. You can probably find it in an ebook for just a few bucks because it's been out for quite a few years now. Um, but man, still just such a great resource for the, on on the the person of the Holy Spirit. To echo that just a little, also if you maybe you're a youth pastor or a pastor on here, and you've read through that book, don't forget that he actually did a DVD series and Bible study on that book itself that you can walk uh, people through in a small group session. And it's it's for good. I've never read the book itself, but I've I've watched the video series and went through that part myself, and I enjoyed that aspect, if nothing else. I've got two recommendations. One I don't think talked about yet, but it's called um, Baptist Faith and Message 2000: Critical Issues in America's Largest Protestant Denomination. Um, so that's for anybody who's interested in learning more about the Baptist Faith and Message. It's um, it's articles written on each article uh, or essays written on each article of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That's a mouthful. And uh, by some people such as Albert Moeller. Yeah, we've all got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Al Moeller, Russell Moore, Paige Patterson, uh, Tom Nettles. Uh, so a good mix of people, uh, f- several other people um, from different kind of aspects or sides of different debates on the uh, Baptist Southern Baptist world, whatever it's called. <laughs> and then I will go with, there's Joe Thorne has a book called uh, Experiencing the Trinity, uh, the grace of God for the people of God. And that's just a relatively short read um, if you're wanting to read a book about the Trinity as well. So James, how about you? All right. Well, I have several for us. As I said earlier, I preached through John this past week and addressed the um, Holy Spirit. And in doing that, I had the opportunity since I was off to read through a couple of books on the Holy Spirit and some that I found fascinating. I to be honest with you, I don't know if it helped me that much in my sermon prep, but I found really fascinating was one by R.C. Sproul called What is the Holy Spirit? Uh, I thought that one was really good. And then um, there's one by Charles Spurgeon called The Indwelling and Outflowing of the Holy Spirit. Both of those were really easy reads. Like I said, I read both of them last week. They were like 50 pages a piece, really, really easy reads, great reads. Um, and then also one other one, and this is just more for the Baptist faith and message as a whole, not just a portion of the Trinity itself is it's a, it's an ebook, I guess is how they've produced it. I don't know if they've put it out any other way. It's called an exposition from the faculty of the Southern Baptist theological seminary on the Baptist faith and message 2000. Now it's very similar to the book that Chris recommended, 
um, except for it's a lot shorter, a lot easier to read. Um, and it's actually more in depth than I, I thought the other one was. The other one kind of addresses some of the issues that's going on with it, but it's more of an exposition of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, and it's free. And so you can't beat free, right? right. And um, I, I'll try to put the link on the show notes for everyone that may be interested in it. But simply all you do is you go to either Al Mohler's website or you go to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary's website and you type in your email address and they, they send it to you and you download it. Now, the only thing I hate about the book is that it's a PDF and not an EPUB. So because it's a PDF, it's just so much harder than an EPUB. But anyway, any listeners that ever release an ebook, do not do a PDF. Do an electronic copy of the book. I hate that whenever I get like a, a free ebook download and then it's a PDF. I'm like, that's it's a free PDF. Yeah. And, you know, I actually forgot about that PDF, which I think if you're just in general wanting to look at an overview of the topics, that's probably the best way to go. The book that I recommended, a lot of the articles or essays deal with specifics about writing the Baptist yeah. faith message 2000 versus other previous versions. So it's a little bit more, uh, it's not as uh, for a general audience. It's a little bit more. Um, I don't even know the, the right word. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird book. Honestly, <laughs> it's, om- it's almost like a commentary on the Baptist faith and message, which is simply a, explanation of what scripture says so it's almost a commentary on a commentary yeah um, and but it's really good i'm i'm actually preaching or teaching through the baptist faith message on our sunday night services and um only one article i have two more articles left and i just discovered this book like three weeks ago jamie actually told me about it and i wish i would have found it like 20 weeks ago when i first started because yeah. that's how helpful it was for me when I did, especially when you get, and we'll talk more about this when we get there, but when you get to the latter, probably like five or six articles in the Baptist Faith and Message, the scriptures that go along with them aren't as relevant as it is for some of the theological things. They're more descriptive rather than prescriptive. Mm-hmm. So And so it's really helpful when you get to some of it later on, like when you get to the church and politics and things of that nature. Well, it's not called that, but we know what I mean. Well, guys, like we said earlier, this is not an exhaustive study on these three articles, but it is an introduction for anyone that may not have read it already and a just a reminder of the beauty of what we believe is Southern Baptist for those that have read through it. And I just want to thank you all for listening, and we hope that you've enjoyed this episode and we are the Everyday Ministry Podcast. We're a podcast where everyday ministers get together to discuss ministry. If you're encouraged by what you hear, please go like our Facebook page, share the episodes, and rate the podcast on iTunes. Don't forget that a new episode drops every first and third Mondays. Our prayer is that these episodes are an encouragement to you and that you would be faithful in the ministry that God has placed you in.
of Rosalie to you Setting off on a one-way train To a place where they know my Heading back to 